We have a, a very different style of class uh, this evening, and uh, I want to get right into it, so let's just begin with a, a prayer, if we can take a couple of moments. Heavenly Father, you are the gift of life, a precious gift that you give to each one of us an opportunity for us to know, love, and serve you in this life, to be with you forever, for eternity. So, Lord, we ask you to be with us this evening, to open our hearts to the words that will be spoken, so that we truly may be a people of life, that we may follow us through your Son, Jesus, who is our Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Tonight we're going to talk about um, life. That's God calling, saying. <laughs> Actually, I was, was going to talk about God. Um, if we go to the, you really with me? Because we really have to. We won't get out at eight thirty unless we we really just follow what's going on here. The first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Uh, we're told that we are made in the image and the likeness of God. That God has created all things. And so, if we are in the image of God, we are called, by that very definition of being an image of God, we're called to be givers of life. Because God gave us the gift of life. And so, what we're called to do on this brief time relatively brief time that we have here on earth, is to cooperate the best that we can with God so that we bring and care for that life and, and life in, in all of its stages. Uh, the gift of life the church teaches us begins right at the moment of conception. And while at that moment we're a, a very, very tiny cell the human person, obviously, in the womb of the mother is, is not totally formed. But the potential for the entire life of that person is there. Um, the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, your height. You're not completely formed yet, but it's all there. None of it yet can be seen, including the human soul. But it's there. Like yourselves right now. Ten years from now, you're going to look different than what you do right now. Why? Because you're still growing, and you're still changing, you're still developing. But the potential of how you look is already deep within you. So like the child in the womb, you're still not at full potential, but you're on your way. And that's one way that we can look at human life. That from the moment of conception till its natural end, we are growing as a person. We are changing as a person. So my, my hope tonight as we um, speak about the issue of life, a lot of times when we think about life and respect life as the church teaches, a lot of times the focus is, as and rightly so, at the most precious time, that moment of conception, the life of the womb. But tonight we want to stretch that a, a little bit more. And we want to talk about life, not only the moment in the womb, but your life now and the gift that it is right now as a human person, as a teenager. And also to go to the other end as we look at the life of, of, of the elderly and the importance and the value and dignity that they have as well and respect that they have as well. And that life which leads to death, but then leads to eternal life. And those, those end, end days, those, those final moments of a person's life on earth, and how valuable, how valuable that can be, important for that person, important for those people that surround that person with love. And so that's what we're going to do tonight, is we're going to look at um, life, the totality of life, from the beginning until its natural end. 
and we're going to kind of do it in a different way. We're going to have three presenters tonight. Uh, we're going to have uh, Mrs. Kahi and Mrs. Hughes, who are going to talk about that first beginnings of life. We're going to have Mr. Cahill, who's going to talk about uh, life right now for you and, and how precious and how, how, um, how much care we should take in, 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 in taking care of our life right now and not taking that life for granted. And then Mrs. St. Laurent, who is from uh, Coyle Cassidy, who's going to uh, speak to us about end-of-life issues. Because it touches us all. Um, we, we're all going to go through these stages. We can't avoid it. And we're going to work and interact with people in these different stages. And we, as followers of Jesus, as members of this church, uh, have to be um, upfront in speaking about this. And in, in, in bringing our faith into all these aspects of our life. We, we don't just park our faith like, a, like a, a, a car outside in the parking lot, but we bring it into every aspect of our life and our interaction with, with one another, our interaction with, with the elderly. Uh, and, and so that's kind of our purpose tonight. And to do this, now that would be tough to have all three... Um, presenters just coming up here. So we're going to move you around. We're going to do 20-minute uh, presentations. We're going to break you up into groups. I'm going to ask for the uh, respect and cooperation that you've showed up to this point for our, our um, presenters. And I want to thank them before we kind of start splitting off here for, for the time that they, they are giving to us tonight to talk about this this most precious gift that God has given us, uh, the gift of life. Thank you, Montana. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be with you tonight. I really am. Um, as Montana said, I work at Crowell and Cassidy High School down the road. I'm the vice principal there. I've worked there for 22 years. And I did see one of my students in the other group. Is anybody here from Crowell? Are you brave to raise your hand? Hello. It's good to see a familiar face. I know it's tough after a long day of school, because I had a long day of school too, to be here tonight, but I'm already so impressed with how reverent you were during the prayer and during the introduction. So again, I'm so happy to have a chance to talk with you this evening. And you know, as Montaigne said, think about um, respectful life. We don't usually think about end of life. We think pretty much about the beginning of life, of course, life beginning at conception and all of those important things that happened. I'm wondering if we could just have the lights down. That would be great. That way you can see what I've got up here for you. But tonight I'd like to talk to you about what happens at that other end, um, at the time when we're dealing with end of life. And you know, beginning of life is a joyous subject, isn't it? We're always happy and excited to welcome a new baby into the world. But we're really not happy and excited when our loved one is coming to the end of life. It's a sad thing. It certainly is. But it can also be a time when we really can grow spiritually. Where we can provide so much to our family and our friends at this time. So tonight, we're going to kind of look at this question of how do we respect life when people are at end of life? And we're going to try to answer some questions. Can we still be respectful of life and refuse a medical treatment? Can we be respectful of life and refuse life support? Can we be respectful of life and still choose to withdraw life support? Is it okay to say, I don't want to be resuscitated if my condition is such that I stop breathing or my heart stops beating? Can I refuse a feeding tube? Can I withdraw a feeding tube once it's been put in? And lastly, and I think you can probably already tell me the answer to this one, can I request physician-assisted suicide? Why do we even think about these questions? Well, in the day and age that we're living in, 2012, would you agree with me that people are living a long time? Yeah, yesterday I uh, spoke to a woman who had just celebrated 100. My mother is in a nursing home and she's 92, and someone who was sitting with her 
was 100. And the woman's mind, I think it was better than mine when we were having a conversation. I couldn't believe how old she was. It's not shocking to reach 100 years of age. In, in my day, when I was your age, it would have been really, un, it would have been so crazy to think that people would live that long. Well, I can't even imagine, God willing, with your good health, how long your life will go on. And I just wanted to show you, people that were born at, um, in the year 1900, their life expectancy was only 47. That, that's almost 10 years younger than me. I'd already be gone. And then as the years go by, it's gone up and up and up and up. So because people are living longer, we have some things to think of past generations didn't have to think about. And another reason why we have to think about these questions is that there are so many advances in medical technology today. Before I began a career in education, I worked as a critical care nurse. I worked as a nurse in, uh, in critical care, and then I worked as a nursing administrator. And even in that time, which you know really is only about 30 years ago, to you I know it's like I'm talking about the 1800s, but we've had so many advances in healthcare. We know that it's not unusual to see people on ventilators, dialysis. We know we can do CPR and save lives. I'm sure you've been trained, maybe some of you. We know one of our own students saved someone's life doing the Heimlich maneuver in a restaurant, saved them from choking. We know people can even have defibrillators implanted in their chest so that if their heart goes into this crazy rhythm, it'll shock them right inside their body. Unbelievable, and it's not even an unusual thing. We know that things like coronary artery bypass, when I was a young nurse many years ago, that was quite the big deal. It's really not anymore. It's something that we see all the time. We also know that we know a lot more about how to live a healthy life than uh, past generations. We can also reverse clinical death, and what I mean by that is when someone's heart stops and their breathing stops, we can, we can change it around. We can actually do CPR and we can restore life. So there's lots of reasons why people are living longer. We also know that back in the day, uh, the leading causes of death mostly were infectious disease, and you may have studied this in school. We didn't have antibiotics, so we know that people often died a sudden death. People often died a sudden death. We know today most of the reasons why people die are related to lifestyle. Heart disease remains the number one cause of death in the United States, heart disease. We know in the US we like to have big portions of food, we don't exercise too much. We like to supersize everything, right? We know that people, uh, obesity is a major problem in our country, and so we know that that can lead to stroke, it can lead to heart disease, and other things. Montigny told you that the, the teaching at end of life, or the teaching of the life ethic for us as Catholic Christians is, you know, our human life is sacred, and we know that it's sacred from the moment of our conception until our natural death. And what does our faith tell us? What does our faith teach us about caring for ourselves? Well, if we look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we're really told to be good stewards of our body, meaning to take good care of ourselves, take good care of ourselves. How does that really play out at end of life? Well, it really means that individuals who are facing a serious illness and are presented with many treatment options, we really have a responsibility to understand everything that's presented to us, to ask questions, to ask a doctor to explain everything to us, and also to evaluate our choices of treatment based on a number of things. I showed you uh, slides in the beginning that said, you know, do we have to accept every treatment? Can we withdraw life support? Can we withdraw a feeding tube? How many of you think that, yes, we could? We could refuse treatments, we could refuse uh, a ventilator, we could refuse to have a life-extending treatment and still be within our moral Catholic faith teaching? Raise your hand if the answer is yes. Okay. Raise your hand if the answer is no, we can't. Uh, there's no in between, so it's yes or no. The yes are correct. But I certainly didn't give you enough information. We really have to be sure that when we're making decisions about whether or not uh, our loved one uh, would need a ventilator, whether they should have chemotherapy, whether they should have treatments, etc. We really would want to make sure that we've understood, is that treatment going to be of benefit to them? If that treatment is, if it's really going to help them, and it's not going to create what we would call an undue burden to them, then we would be morally obligated to have that treatment. But it doesn't always have to be that way. Sometimes, I've had many of the people I work with who are my age, 
who have aging parents. And sometimes they ask me the question, I, I taught bioethics at Coyle for many years, they ask the question, you know, my mother is, is dying, she's um, elderly, and they want to know about doing a treatment, but my mother doesn't really want it, it would be very, very painful for her, and there's really not a good chance it's going to help her. Well, with those circumstances, you know, it would be okay to say that. We can still be very respectful of our life as we get older without necessarily having all kinds of medical treatments. On the other hand, sometimes those things are important. So we need to really know that it depends on the situation that we're in. Well, something that's always a no, we would say it's always a moral evil, is something that's extremely important to us who live in Massachusetts. Why is physician-assisted suicide right now, today, November 5th, an issue that I'm out and about talking about? Yes. Excellent, okay. Tomorrow in Massachusetts, we will be um, the third state that will be looking at this particular issue uh, of physician-assisted suicide. Physician-assisted suicide means that a doctor could prescribe a lethal dose of medication um, to end a person's life, a patient's life. It's currently legal in two states in the U.S. Oregon is one that's been since 1997 and Washington State since 2009. And physician-assisted suicide has been legal in the Netherlands for a very long time. How many of you knew that that was gonna be on the ballot tomorrow? Excellent. Well, please uh, congratulate your teachers or family who has talked to you about it. I know you're not of voting age, but it's really important that you guys really understand this. So what this means is that a physician who is licensed in Massachusetts, if in fact this vote went through, would be able to prescribe medication to end a terminally ill patient's life at that person's request. If this is passed, it becomes law, January 1st, 2013. There's no other legislative process necessary here. If the Mass legislators looked at this, they didn't want to vote on it. So it is in the hands of Massachusetts voters. And the bill as it's written is law as it's written, January 1st, if in fact it is a yes vote. No other additional legislative process is necessary. Anybody 18 years or older who's a resident of Massachusetts who has been diagnosed with a terminal illness, meaning they have six months or fewer to live, would be able to request that their doctor prescribe a medication for them to commit suicide. They would ask this doctor in, uh, orally, and they would ask the doctor in writing. They could ask the doctor themselves, but if they're not able to communicate, then somebody could ask for them, someone who is familiar with their method of communicating. I think that's kind of a scary thing. Okay, so they or someone who um, says that they're familiar with how they can communicate can ask for this. They ask two times, and they have to ask 15 days apart. Once they ask two times, then they would sign a consent form. And at your age, you're not allowed to sign a consent form for yourself. Right now, your parents have to sign a consent form for any type of uh, medical procedure. Yes? That's, that's correct. Very good. Two doctors have to say that your diagnosis is a terminal illness. Well, actually, people could ask for this without having any pain and be fully functional. The only criteria, the only criteria is that they're diagnosed with an illness that, in the opinion of the doctor, would um, be a terminal illness. They could be fully functional and having and feeling fine. Um, two people uh, have to witness that you're signing the consent form. One of them can't be a relative or somebody who could benefit from your death. Um, like an heir to your estate, et cetera. One of them can't be. So if one of them can't be, and there's two witnesses, what does that mean about the other one? Very good. So one of the people who witness your consent form could be someone that could benefit from your, from your death. Once the consent form is signed, the doctor writes a prescription. How many of you have ever had a prescription written by your physician? I'm sure it's been for antibiotics probably, right? or something like that. So we, we're familiar with that. But this prescription is a little bit different, okay? This prescription is going to be given to a pharmacist, and then um, 48 hours later, that patient or someone who they designate to get the medicine for them 
is going to be given uh, an extremely powerful prescription of a narcotic that's called Secanol. How many of you have seen the commercials on TV with the pharmacists, yeah, opening the Secanol? Secanol isn't really used anymore. When it was used, it was primarily used as a sleeping pill, but never, never in that amount. So that person is given 100 capsules, 100 capsules of Secanol. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I could consume 100 capsules. I don't think you could either. So those capsules actually have to be opened up, and the powder in them is empty. It's about three tablespoons. And that powder is mixed up in water, or it's mixed up in juice, or it's stirred into a pudding. And then the person who is ending their life is going to consume that, and I say mention it's given to the patient or their doctor or whoever they choose, and they have to self-administer it. That's why it's physician-assisted suicide. They take this drink, and they have to drink it down within a minute to a minute and a half for it to work. A minute to a minute and a half is not a long time. If they didn't drink it down like that, it wouldn't have the effect. Second all, it's not a painkiller. It's never ever used as a painkiller. It's only used here in this overdose to end that person's life. So the, the patient actually is committing suicide. The reason why it's called physician-assisted suicide, it's very misleading, I think. The assisting part is writing the prescription. I think some people think, oh, physician-assisted, well, that must mean that the doctor is helping me. It must mean that somebody's there providing medication for me at end of life giving me medicine or comfort care to ease pain. That's not the case here at all. It's simply a doctor writing an overdose of a prescription of 100 Secanol that the person takes at home on their own. There's no physician present, um, and the family does not even have to be notified. There's no requirement here in this bill for a psychiatric evaluation, yet we know that people who are at end of life are often depressed, of course they are. Also, there's no specific criteria to evaluate mental capacity that's written in the bill. And the average physician is, is really not qualified to make a psychiatric evaluation, yet they're not required to make the person go for a psychiatric evaluation. Another thing that's a real flaw in this is that although, as you mentioned, two physicians have to uh, concur, it's a terminal illness, doctors agree there is really no way to predict life expectancy. And a six month Life expectancy is often wildly inaccurate. Individuals who've been given that diagnosis can live for many, many months, sometimes even years beyond that initial diagnosis. The Massachusetts Medical Society has come out in real strong opposition against this, and that's one of the reasons why. Um, also, when they talk about the diagnosis of six months, it doesn't say whether that means with a medical treatment or without medical treatment, and that could be very different. And we know that those predictions are wildly inaccurate. Yes? Yes, that's an excellent question. The question was, could the doctor refuse to write the prescription? Yes. In Oregon, where this has been legal for a long time, unfortunately, there are physicians who are, who are happy to write the prescription. And there's a group of people that are called Compassion and Choices in Oregon. Not only will they hook you up with the physician to write it, but they'll also come to your house and they'll make the drink for you. And that's the truth, that's what happens in Oregon. So it's something we have to really, really pay attention to. Um, there's also no requirement here for that patient to be have a consultation with hospice or palliative care. Hospice and palliative care you know, are organizations whose whole job it is is to support and be with individuals at end of life. They're experts in pain management. And there's no reason in 2012 why, why individuals at end of life have to have extreme pain and suffering. There isn't. Medications that are given appropriately, that are given correctly by experts in pain management, you can have and people who are certified in pain, pain management can alleviate that pain and suffering without ending that person's life. And there's also no requirement here to notify family. Family members do not have to be notified in order for the person to get the prescription. We know that from many, many studies that have been done, people who desire suicide at end of life. They're often depressed. They have feelings of hopelessness. They may feel they're a burden on their family. They may feel that they are going to lose control. And all of that fear, anxiety, 
may drive someone to want to end their life. And we really need to help people who are feeling this way. What people need in end of life is they need to have access to hospice and palliative care. They need to have emotional support for them and for their family, of course. Access to effective pain management and need to be educated on end of life issues. It's really, really important that individuals who face this don't face it alone and know that they're loved and that they're supported. When we speak about the sacredness of human life at, at end of life, you know, as Montini said, we're looking at the moment of conception till natural death. Human life is sacred at every age, every age, and every stage of life. No matter if we're healthy or sick, whether it's the beginning or the end of our life. Yes, you certainly can. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. Hospice is an organization, um, when there are many of them throughout the state, made up of doctors, nurses, social workers, uh, chaplains, nursing aides, and also volunteers. When an individual receives a terminal diagnosis, their doctor orders hospice care for them, and then a team of individuals come to the person's home, they evaluate the person's needs, they can provide everything from hospital equipment, like a hospital bed for a patient, or a walker, or supplies needed at the home. The nurse comes and prescribes medication so that the patient can be made as comfortable as possible. They also provide education and support for their family from the time that patient receives hospice care to the end of their life. They will come to the home, they will be with the family as often as the family needs, Volunteers can come and relieve the family if they want some time at home, uh, you know, some rest from that. Um, in my own life, I've had this situation occur with my own family members and very close friends. So it's a group that is dedicated to helping people achieve the best end of life that they possibly can. So I'm going to try to wrap it up because I've gotten a sign here from Montina. You've been such an incredibly attentive audience. And I just want to share this last thing with you. Our life, we're made in God's image, we know that. No matter how old we are, whatever our condition is, we certainly don't want to say to people who are at end of life, your life isn't, isn't valuable, we're gonna help you by allowing you to take this overdose. No, what we wanna do is we wanna be educated on this and we wanna let people know that they're so important to us, we will help and support them even at the very last stages of their life. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Well, it's great to see everybody again. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Also, on Sunday, I was able to be at the Spirit of Life Mass, and I have to say how impressed I was with the readers, the gift bearers, all those that helped collect it, and so forth. We're very reverent at the Mass, and it says a lot about this class in general, so keep up the great work. Um, tonight, I am very happy be here, and you'll notice a couple of phone numbers. They're, they're here now, and they'll be here throughout the night, and also after this presentation, if anybody had any specific question, or after class, I'll we'll be around to answer them as well. But as we, we mentioned about, we, we've been blessed with that gift of faith. You know, God brings us into this world, and our world begins with God, and it ends with God. It's, it's all in God's time. Um, and I know tonight, some of the things we're gonna talk about a little sensitive, but yet, Hopefully my goal tonight in talking to you is perhaps I can provide you with at least one more things that could perhaps help you, help one of your friends, perhaps even save a life. Um, these phone numbers up here are for the Samaritans, it's a suicide hotline, and Catholic Social Services. Should you ever need them or need a friend, um, that might help. You've all heard me say in the past, and I think there's 168 hours in a week. So I want you just for a brief second to think about how you spend your time. And as you're thinking about that time, for instance, when I say I knew today you went to school, I want you to take your hand and I want you to type it as hard as you can and not let it go. And each time I say something, I want you to tighten up another part of your body, your other hand. So, for instance, you're in school today and you got homework too, so let's tighten up your mind. Don't let it go. And then you find out in school today you have a big test tomorrow. Oh, yes. Okay? Um, you have practice for a sport event or theater activity. Keep tightening up another part of your body. You were made fun of at school today. 
life just might seem a little crazy and a little hot and you don't know what to do. So as all those pots in your body are tightened up, I want you for a moment now to look at the cross and let all that things go away. You feel a little better, don't you? And we know our faith, you know, we know God suffered for us, but he's there to take all our suffering. Those things don't happen, and we think nobody cares. 
because I know I only have 20 minutes. It's a short amount of time, there's a lot of stuff we're covering, so I'm giving you some of the basics, but there's a lot more statistics. But one of the causes is when divorce is in the family. Sometimes as children, we blame ourselves. You know, it's not your fault. But those are things that your moms and dads have come to a decision. Sometimes there's violence at home and we just want to put an end to it. We're tired or sometimes we might be the one being abused. And that makes us feel worthless or ashamed. Inability to succeed at school. Um, there's so much pressure out there. Many of you in high school, your freshmen, but you're already talking about what college you're going to go to. And I've got to get these grades. And, you know, for many people, Friday, you have a first quarter ending. Or the first trimester is going to end, and I don't have the grades that I have, and now I'm a failure. No. As I mentioned earlier, you're all unique. Not everybody in these stands is going to get all A's. Not everybody's going to get all B's. But probably all at some point may experience that feeling great. That doesn't mean that we're a failure. I know it adds to our stress, but yet, what can we do about it, and who can help us succeed so we can get maybe a D or a C or an A the next time? Turn into the substance of this, which we talked about. Or sometimes there may be a death in the family, or someone that we're close to. We just can't cope with help, and we want to be with them. Well, as Catholics, we know, and we pray that they're in the hands of God. And hopefully they're looking out over us. And we can still pray for them and believe that they're there. But that doesn't give us the right to say, well, I'm going to make a decision to take my life. Because that would be the wrong thing to do. And there are many more factors that we can talk about, but there's just not enough. Think about right now. How are things going for you? And this is very important. Because as you all came in here tonight, I asked many of you how you were doing in this group and the other two groups. I heard responses like great, with a big smile, good, with a so so smile. Mm. What a way. But I heard some people like, all right. I heard some people say good, but their head was down and not even looking up. People communicate things in many different ways. You communicate things in many different ways. And I think it's very important to question to pay attention to that body language. Because there are really two types of communication. Our verbal skills and our non-verbal skills. What do I mean by verbal skills, anybody? Things we... And the non-verbal skills? Things we do. Okay? So, if you're asking someone how they're doing and they say great, and they're happy, and they appear very happy, and you're happy for them, that's wonderful. But if somebody's saying great, their body language is saying something else. Are we just going to say, okay, and keep walking? We're going to say, hey, things really great. You look a little better. Or you're in school and everybody's having a great old time, but you do see that one person that's alone in the corner, head down, feeling eating lunch. Are we going to be that disciple and be Christ to God? Hey, is everything all right? Can I sit with you? No, I just was studying the test. Okay. Or, okay. You might see that smile. You, you just made me feel great. Hey, I have a seat. I, I think those are things that we miss in today's world as it, it, teens, because so many of us are so busy texting. We're not paying attention to what people are really saying, how they're truly feeling, what somebody's body language is saying. So you can definitely make a difference. If you're willing to do that. Some signs that you can look for if somebody is feeling a bit down. They 
Did your friend constantly talk and go deaf? You know, all your conversations revolve around deaf. And if they are, do you just say, oh, okay, you keep just listening but not saying anything? Or do you question and say, why are you always talking about dying? What's that fascination? Do they tell you they want to die? If someone's telling you that they don't feel worthy and they wish they didn't exist anymore, that's serious. That's not, oh, okay, I get to practice. That's, you know, do you have a plan? Have you really thought about it? start to withdraw from the family and friends. <coughs> you know, sometimes you see the most outgoing people and all of a sudden they don't even want people to run. Or they just become very quiet or they walk with their heads down. We need to reach out to them. Um, turn into the substance abuse or giving away all their items. You know, again, just some of the signs that flags would go up. suspect something or you see some of those flags or even if you're experiencing some, some of these feelings yourself. You know, perhaps this is the time that we can get some help. How can you help someone or even with yourself if um, you think someone's in need? Seek help from your guidance counselors. Your schools have wonderful guidance counselors and they're there to help you. I know you may need them periodically because the school makes you. But if there's an issue at home or you're not feeling quite yourself and you don't know how to handle some of the stresses that are going on in your life, make an appointment. Even talk to your parents if you think you need professional help or if one of your friends may need some professional help. Whether I talk to their parents or talk to your guidance the counselor and help them, they will intervene. Talk about troubles you may be experiencing. None of us are perfect. We all stumble along the way. We may mess up. But if we don't talk about the things that are going on in our lives and we keep stuck in all those negative feelings, negative feelings, at some point, we're going to get to
tell anyone. You're only 14, 15 years old. You're not professionals. And that's a lot to take on. By keeping that secret, how would you feel if something did happen? I would rather have my friend mad at me because I cared enough about them to get them the help that they need than to just ignore someone who may be in crisis, who really needs help, who turned to me for help, but I didn't follow through and get them the help that they truly did need. And that's like,
And he wrote this book called The Gospel of Life, and he starts with the very beginning of conception, and he moves right on to what you already heard about in the life issues. And with that, as a Catholic Church, we believe God is our origin, and God is our destiny. And God calls us. In the Bible, we hear God calling Jeremiah, before you were born, I called you in the womb. Before you were born, I called you. Before you were born, he knew Jeremiah. Before you were born, he knew you. He knows everybody that he was calling into life. He knew you. Then we read in the Gospel of John, John tells, God, Christ tells his apostles that in my father's house there are many rooms. He's calling us all back that heaven is this place for all of us. Our destiny, our origin, where we are and where we should be. And as John Paul tells us in his book that our life
And the baby now is developing in there. And that is all called implantation. And the reason I want to say that, because I want to impress upon you that medical science and Catholic Church is telling you life begins here at conception. There's a new thought and a new teaching out there that's telling us, and it's not true, that human life begins in implantation. It doesn't. By the end of the month, even by 28 days, you know, it doesn't look human, but that's all, how we all look. This, uh, you can see the liver, the heart. The heart is beating. The baby has a heart at the end of 28 days. And blood is circulating through that baby's body. Baby's going to grow very rapidly now. Two, two months, two, two, three. And you can see the changes. Baby's head is bigger because the brain is developing and the body hasn't caught up yet. And that's the quote I was talking about. Mother's womb, and this is how the baby gets its nutrition. Four months. Baby sleeping, dreaming, sucking his thumb. Like a newborn baby. Like a newborn baby. He does everything a newborn baby does. And you can see this at five months. This baby now has everything. All his organs. Heart, liver, spleen, brain. It's all there. And he can hear his mother's voice. He can hear his mother's heartbeat. the baby again at six months. The baby has two fingernails. This is a life. This life is not protected according to the laws of our country. This baby can be aborted. This is what our laws are saying. This is why you need to be informed. And this is why you really need to inform yourself about what's going on here. This baby we had at five months and my pulse is six months. The baby is um, here, and we can see. Like any little baby you might see in a cradle, thumb in the mouth. And the little poem I found, it says, if he is not alive, why is he growing? Because you saw that in the film. Baby at six months, remember how tiny it was back at two months when the head was bigger? The head's not so big now, portion with the body. So why is he growing? If he's not a human being, what kind of being is he? If he is not a child, why is he sucking his thumb? If he is not a if he is a living human being, why is it legal to kill him? As I told the other class, I thought um, my son turned forty this year, and in um, January, it will be 40 years since countries had abortion on their books. And while there were a group of people working to stop this from happening, which we didn't succeed with, I was pregnant with my son. I could feel him. In the meantime, I'm going to meetings trying to protect other people so that their babies can be born also. And he was about three months old, and he was in my arms, and I had this beautiful gift from God because our lives are a gift from God. When the news came back, no longer would this unborn child be safe from abortion. It's legal at any stage to take this life of this unborn baby. And with that, I wanted to share a couple of things with you about a few people that I've met. And one of them is a very good friend of mine. Her name is Beth. And when Beth was toward the end of high school, she, uh, she knew she was going to go on to nursing school, and she kind of had her life like where it was going to go. And she had a date with an uh, older guy, which on her part she knew in retrospect wasn't a good thing. And he did, he raped her. And from that rape, she got pregnant. She never once considered an abortion. She knew she could have went to her doctor and sure. But this was a human life. This was a life from God. Beth knew that there was something she couldn't give her a son. She couldn't give him a family. She couldn't give him a dad. So she decided that her baby would be adopted. And 
she adopted, the baby went up for adoption. The baby was adopted by a wonderful family, and she knew that the baby was fine. But as I knew Bevan throughout the years, she would always say things like, today's his 10th birthday, and I wonder what he's doing. Today he's 16, I wonder if he's driving a car. And we, us as friends would hear this from her all the time. She was grieving her son, she missed him. But it was almost a joy, because she knew he was alive, and he was happy, his life was going on. The other person was Jessica, whom I met when I worked in the <coughs> pregnancy help center. Jessica had an abortion. Jessica was a Catholic young woman and decided that when she was pregnant, what could she do? She didn't even look at any option. After she had the abortion, she went into a real bad depression. Um, she cried a lot. She was depressed. Her baby was gone. What did she do? Why did she do it? Why didn't somebody help her? Jessica went to a priest, and, and the priest said to her, you know, God forgives you. If God can forgive anything, God forgives you, but you have to forgive yourself. She said, I can never forgive myself. My baby's gone. I cannot forgive myself. Now, I have a question to you. How is an abortion good for a woman if it's going to lead her into a depression? a depression that she feels she can never come out of because she can never forgive herself. I don't see how that can be a good thing. The next person I wanted to share with you is a young man, a friend of, um, a son of my friend. And he became a dad. Well, he didn't become a, he and his girlfriend got pregnant, and his girlfriend. And they knew that they didn't want to get married. That really wasn't an option for them. And she decided, well, she's going to have an abortion. And her mother said, well, that's fine. That seems like a good, good decision. Now, guys, he didn't want this to happen. This was his child. He knew it was a life. He was the father. No right. Because the law says that a woman has a right to do what she wants with a boy. It was her decision. He begged her, and he promised her that he would be there for her. He would be the father please have the child. She did. She realized that she really didn't want to be a mother. She was too young. There were things that she just couldn't handle. So he took all the rights. The mother left the girl's life, and he, he was her mom and dad. Eventually, he got married, and she, of course, became like an older sibling because they had other children. She's in his family. She's a 24-year-old woman now. He almost didn't have her because the law says that he had no right. So when I, I would like you to think about that. When you hear it's a woman's concern, it's a woman's decision, it's a woman's right to choose, it's not. It's a life issue. It's a life issue. This is a child at six months in the womb. Looks Looks like a newborn baby because that's exactly what it is, a baby. We were all there. Even Christ came to us as a newborn baby. We get all excited about Christmas, but what's Christmas all about? It's about Christ coming to the world. Incarnation. He became flesh. The Word became flesh. Christ came to us as a child. You read it even the Gospel of might be Luke when Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth knows that Mary's the mother of the Savior. How does she know this? Because the child in her womb, who was John the Baptist, leaped for joy. This unborn child in Elizabeth's womb hits and jumps with joy because the new is in the presence of God. She felt the movement of her baby like every mother who's ever had a child feels the movement of her child, not safe from an abortion. When we started with Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was called by God, and God says, before you were born, I knew you. God knew all of us before we were born. God been waiting for us. But God wanted Jeremiah to be prophet. God had a plan for him. And Jeremiah said, oh, no, 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 I'm too young. I'm too young. And God tells him, just say not that you're too young. 
because I will be with you. Wherever I, wherever I send you, I will go. And do not be afraid, for I am with you always. Jeremiah was probably about your age when God called him. And that's one of the reasons I like to quote Jeremiah. Because he was your age. And God calls us at any age. And you are really the people who are going to be out there as you move on through high school and college or the workforce or the service or wherever your life, life takes you. You will probably encounter people who are going to make these decisions. Shh, I'm going to have an abortion. Should I have? And you need to pray for the courage <coughs> to stand up for life. You need to be like Jeremiah and speak and help this person on these choices not just like, okay, it's her body, you're going to do what you want with it. No, it's a new life. It's a new life. A couple of years ago, I was down in Washington, and every year they have the March, March for Life, and there were a lot of young people there. Um, he, we went to a convention, because I went with um, Fia, and the whole Verizon Center, where they play basketball and hockey, it was filled. It was there were people in the lobby that couldn't get into the Verizon Center for this youth rally they were having. And it was great to see so many young people. And we're from, of course, Edinburgh, and we're thinking, oh, gee, not, we have traveled nine hours. There were kids there from Kansas. They traveled three days. And it was just great to see them, and as they marched, because it just makes me feel good that I hope that this generation will be a generation that chooses like my generation didn't. <coughs> and as we marched, they were holding the sign up, and it was important, that elephant with his little flower in his trunk. And um, they were saying that a person is a person no matter how small. This baby is 10 weeks in his mother's womb. Probably can't even sing him back there in the palm of my hand. A person is a person, no matter how small. This baby, seven months. This is, you want to come up and feel him afterwards. No. This is about how big a baby might be in his mother's womb at seven months. Close to a newborn, a newborn would be bigger. The law says this baby can be aborted. We need to pray for an end to abortion. We need to inform ourselves about what it really is. We need to pray to have the courage to speak up against it. Because the ball's going to be in your court. You are the ones coming up, and you do need to be informed. And I will pray for you, but you are. And I thank you. If anybody has a question, you have given us. Let's pray tonight for new lives that will be conceived, that they may be able to live as you, God, have called them to live, have called them into life, that no one will prevent that unborn child to have the potential of life. We pray for young people this evening, Lord, and adults who are struggling in their own life and maybe have no hope. Let's pray that you might enlighten them, Lord, might give them hope, might bring people into their life that value life and, and help them out of their darkness. And finally, Lord, let us pray for those who are dying or are near death, that we may treat them with the dignity and respect that they so deserve because all men and women and young people have been made in your image and in your likeness. We hold all our people up to you this evening. We hold these young people in this prayer. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, 
Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thank you, Father, Son, You're great tonight. Thank you very, very much. Hope you got something out of it.